Good afternoon, everyone. Try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. I mean, come on, guys. It's 2 o'clock. You ought to be over the dinner lag by now. We're doing good. Uh, distinguished guests, friends of Aaron Cotta, it's my privilege today to talk something that's near and dear to our heart, and that is the competitiveness of the Philippines as a country. And today's, you know, we know what the problems are. Today's panel has been challenged to come up with the solutions, to identify the solutions during the next decade that these uh, two, the solutions that restrain us in our competitiveness. We all should pat ourselves on the back. We've done a good job in the last few years. We know what we do right. I'll run through a few of them. Some of the positive indicators. As John Forbes mentioned earlier today in his slide, we've had 500% in recent years in foreign direct investment. We all know we see the Moody's ratings, the other ratings, competitive ratings. We're now up into all of the rating agencies. The growth in the manufacturing, manufacturing continues to outgrow uh, GDP as a general. Our manufacturing, our BPO, and our tourism industries have grown significantly in the last few years. Overall, political stability is here. We're almost to the top third of the competitive rankings in WEF. Almost. Within the year, hopefully by the end of this administration, we'll be there. As I travel across the, the region and in the United States, I hear this buzz going on about the Philippines. We now have a new restored international respect for this country. It's great heartwarming to hear. There's a perception that this is an honest government. Certainly the honesty in governance has improved drastically. We now have a two-tier minimum wage system. Much more spending on infrastructure, much more spending on human capital. Things are looking good, but there's always room for improvement. And so many of the businesses, so many of the industries, so many activities we do with there in Cata, we're always benchmarked and measured against ASEAN 6. And currently we're still down in the lower half of the ASEAN 6. That's not acceptable to anybody. We must be more competitive. It seems that our competitors in the ASEAN region are not resting on their laurels, so we must do more to get much more competitive. So this panel will discuss, today we want to talk about bold ideas, not the normal things, but the bold ideas and resolve the challenges for this country that hold us back from being more competitive. So if I could right now, I'd like to call on stage our speaker, our panelist, and our moderator. Our guest speaker for today on competitiveness is the Honorable Senator Paolo Benino Bamakino IV. He's the chairman of the Senate Committee on Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. He said keep it short, but I will tell you more about him. He is the Senate, uh, he's, he chairs the Senate Committee on Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship, and he's going to be talking about legislation and other reforms to become more competitive. Before he was elected senator, he was already recognized as one of the best known for his significant accomplishments and also moving forward in the first term as senator on the cabotage law as well as the competition law. Congratulations on that, Senator. Our panel will include Mr. Competitive himself, Mr. Bill Guillermo Luz, private sector co-chairman of the National Competitive Council. Bill. Bill is a veteran speaker at the Ver uh, he's no stranger to Aaron Cutter Forum. I've been to three and he's been our uh, fabulous speaker at all of them. He last year, Bill, also went extra duty as the Chief Operating Officer for the APIC 2015 CEO Summit Conference and creating better, future, stronger together. Next panelist will be Ambassador Donald D. Donald will join us on stage. Ambassador D is the Honorary Chairman and CEO of PCCI, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's a businessman, civic leader, and for, and for many more years than he cares to admit, he's been an advocate of reform to improve the country's business climate. Also joining this panel, we are lucky to have two of the presidents of our foreign chambers. The first one will be Mr. Yoshio Amano, who will summarize the bold reforms needed in the manufacturing sector. And head of the European Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Gunter Toss who will summarize bold reforms for the sunshine creative industry sector. Thank you very much. 
And of course, rounding out our panel is our moderator. We couldn't have a panel without a moderator. Mr. Quentin Pastrana, anchor and producer from our media sponsor, Bloomberg TV. Again, thank you for being here. After the speaker finishes, uh, Senator uh, Kino will do his speech. And then they will be the, the panel will do that, and obviously Mr. Pastrano will be chairing, moderating the deal. We look for a very lively panel. At this time, I'd like to ask Senator Benino Aquino the fourth to please make his presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon. Magandang hapon. Good afternoon, everyone. There you go. Uh, Kintin was saying that's the post-lunch coma that everyone is undergoing. We hope that this panel can be uh, interesting for all of you. Magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be speaking to you today about the reforms we've been working on to foster competitiveness within our local industries. For those of us who have been working in the field of entrepreneurship, for those of us here who have been pushing to get more support for our local micro, small, and medium enterprise sector. The struggle has been to bring this conversation to the mainstream and get the public behind this cause. When I became a center in 2013, inclusive growth was and is still our number one priority. But this must be more than just a buzzword, more than just a government priority. Inclusive growth is now an imperative for our country and must be prioritized by everyone in our society. If we can ensure the growth of micro-enterprises into small enterprises, if we can empower the small enterprises to become medium enterprises, and so on and so forth, if MSMEs have a support system that allows them to see a clear path to becoming a larger, sustainable, thriving business, we can and we will achieve inclusive growth by creating jobs, spreading the wealth, and spreading these opportunities across our country. And if we are successful, we can actually end poverty in the Philippines. In the APEC a couple of months ago, the theme was building inclusive economies, building a better world. And during the APEC SME Summit, President Aquino said, business leads to the creation of even more opportunities for other Filipinos. And the Philippines is determined to lead efforts to spur the growth of APEC SMEs. With world leaders like President Aquino, even President Obama, and the other world leaders who are present at the APEC taking notice, we find that this is the best time to push for policies that support small businesses, enhance competitiveness, and ensure inclusive growth in our country. In 2007, I co-founded the Hapinoy Program, where we worked with Filipino micro-entrepreneurs, particularly Sari Sari store owners, uh, for our friends here who aren't Filipinos, within a few months of living here, I'm sure you've seen a Sari Sari store. Together with our microfinance partners, we wanted to support micro-entrepreneurs living in poor and marginalized communities in our rural countryside to grow their business and make a better life for themselves and their families. With their newfound confidence, their newfound learning, many of our Nanay micro-entrepreneurs managed all parts of their business as well, and became true success stories. These mothers, or we call them nanais, started seeing themselves as capable business owners, as managers, and even as leaders of their community. Most of them were from our microfinance partner, and they would say to us in Filipino, noon po, nangungutang lang po kami, ngayon po, entrepreneur na. In English, previously we were just borrowers, but now we are entrepreneurs. We found that with the right programs, the right interventions, these micro-entrepreneurs, most of whom didn't finish high school, most of whom were female and mothers, could graduate to become successful entrepreneurs. What we found was a basic formula for helping and supporting them. We call this our three Ms. Money, mentorship, and market. And interestingly enough, if you look at our track record of laws that we have passed in the past three years, many of these policies fall under the same three Ms. Money, mentorship, and market. For example, under money, we passed Republic Act 10693, or the Microfinance NGO Act. This piece of legislation supports our microfinance NGOs that provide non-collateralized loans to low-income households and micro-entrepreneurs, while also providing our second M, which is mentorship. 
through training programs and seminars to enhance the skills and financial literacy of their borrowers. Our most recent law to be passed, and this is actually my eighth law, is RA 10744, or the Credit Surety Fund Cooperative Act. This is another measure in partnership with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas under the second M, under the first M, which is money. And it's a measure that will support small and medium enterprises in accessing credit. This targets the missing middle in our financing landscape. SMEs with loan requirements that range from 500,000 pesos to 5 million pesos, hopefully complete, completing the whole financial inclusion supply chain. Under the second M, which is mentorship, the third policy I'd like to share with you is RA 10679, or the Youth Entrepreneurship Act. This is our bet on the youth because it includes financial literacy and entrepreneurial training in basic education, grooming young Filipinos to become the future entrepreneurs of our country. This measure has provisions on enabling promising young entrepreneurs with grants and financing as we put our faith in the youth to generate jobs not only for themselves but also for the people in their community. A major concern for most startups and for most MSMEs is access to markets that ability to get your goods and services to larger markets outside of your barangay, outside of your village, outside of your family circle, outside of your province and toward a nationwide presence, maybe even a worldwide presence. The first law we passed, of course, in partnership with the DTI, and I see Yusek Dimagiba sitting over there, is, the R, is RA 10644, which is the Go Negocio Act. This mandates the establishment of negotiation centers in every town, city, municipality, and province of the Philippines to serve as a network of support for entrepreneurs, linking them to suppliers and larger markets. Negotiation centers serve as a convergence point, linking all of the three M's, money, mentorship, and market, to our Filipino entrepreneurs and our Filipino MSMEs. In 2015, under the leadership of Secretary Domingo and uh, under Secretary Maglaya, we were able to put up 150 negotiation centers all over the Philippines. This year, we'll be able to put up 150 more. So by the end of 2016, we will have put up 300 negotiation centers supporting our MSMEs with their basic needs. These are negotiation centers found in local government units, found with our microfinance partners, found in our academe partners, where our MSMEs can go, ask for support for their financing programs, get linked, to both public and private programs for their financing needs, be able to get training and mentorship that they need for their businesses, and most importantly, be able to be linked to larger markets, larger than what they currently are experiencing. This was actually my first law, passed in 2014, and I'm happy to tell all of you that in the two years that this has been law, the DTI has taken the leadership to really push the agenda and create these support hubs for our MSMEs. One of the more challenging legislations we had to pass, and one that directly spurs competition, was RA 10668, or the Foreign Ships Co-Loading Act, better known as the Amendments to our Cabotage Policy. This law basically opens up our ports to foreign ships, allowing them to compete with the local shipping companies. This is really good for our SMEs, bringing down costs and allowing them to serve larger markets quicker. This is one of those laws that took a very long time to pass, but we were quite happy that we were able to pass this last year. This was actually one of the priority areas for Arancada two years ago. And the other priority area for Arancada two years ago is the Philippine Competition Act. We realized that there was a need to establish ground rules in doing business in the Philippines for startups and for MSMEs to have better chances of getting a piece of the market share. We needed to ensure that businesses are competing in the market through innovation and through quality and through price, not simply through size and muscle to impose barriers to entry. The Philippine Competition Act, 25 years in the making and signed into law just last July 2015, will set ground rules to create a fair business environment and penalize abuses in dominant position and anti-competitive behavior to level the playing field for our SMEs. Of the eight laws under our belt, the Philippine Competition Act is the most difficult one passed by our office. It took us almost, almost a year to actually get this passed in the Senate. Arancada, of course, was one of the first groups that came to us and shared with us the importance of getting this law passed. 
alongside the Chamber of Commerce who provided us with the first draft. Groups like Go Negocio and many of your institutions helped us get this law passed. So I'm happy to say that after so many years, we are at par with many of our uh, neighboring countries by having our own antitrust uh, legislation. It is one of the most fulfilling uh, laws that we have passed. Tremendous potential to transform the Philippine business environment to one that is more fair, more ethical, and more conducive to growth and development of our startups and MSMEs. And I'm also happy to announce, as many of you know, that the Philippine Competition Commission has already been formed. In fact, um, every time there's an invitation for me to talk about this bill, I always tell them, just invite the new chairman and the commissioners. Um, for our office, it's time to move on to other challenges. So, for the newly minted Philippine Competition Commission, under the leadership of former Secretary R.C. Balisakan, kayo na ang bahala, and we wish you the best. We hope that, indeed, through your work, we will be able to see and fulfill the potential of the, Philippine, of the Philippine Competition Act in our shores. A lot of our countrymen, dear friends, have the misconception that victory over poverty is an amorphous, undefined goal. But the truth is, it takes sound economic policies, strong political will, support for the smallest and the least, our MSMEs, hardworking entrepreneurs, ethical and innovative businesses, a convergence of all of our efforts, a lot of time, a bit of luck, and unrelenting grit. It takes all of these to fight poverty in our country. And if we can work together, if we can have multiple stakeholders with a common goal, working towards inclusiveness, working to end poverty, working for the competitiveness of our country, I'm sure we'll be able to get to our goal, which is to end poverty. It is a competitive MSME sector that is the key to unlocking the full potential, not only of inclusive growth, but the full potential of the Philippines. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me again. You actually invited me last year, but last year I hadn't passed the Competition Act and the Cabotage Act yet. I said I'd only show my face here if we actually get to pass those laws. So I'm back, and hopefully we can work on more uh, reforms together. We can work on more of this important legislation together. Maraming salamat po. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Senator Aquino, thank you so much for your remarks and for outlining the raft of legislation you've done to level the playing field and create a more inclusive business environment. Now, this sets it up nicely for this robust panel, so I'm going to get out of the way and ask a couple of questions. First of all, to the two gentlemen to the left of Senator Aquino, Bill and Ambassador Dee. One of the things we've noticed in your scorecard in the National Competitiveness Council, in your website, is that five years of continuous growth in terms of the rankings and improvement. But there have been dips in the last year, namely with the World Bank, Transparency International, after four years of growth, and the World Economic Forum. And this varies by the slots and the numbers. One thing I wanted to put into context is the downscaling of the numbers. And you look at one of the uh, figures here. We are ranked by the World Bank as 165th out of 189 countries in days to start a business. And that's for the entry level of either an SME or a multinational corporation coming in the Philippines. And then, for people who are in the country already, we've gotten in, we are 140th out of 189 in terms of enforcing contracts. So on both those sides, your greenfield investments and the brownfield investments, there's a bit of difficulty in terms of enhancing competitiveness. My question to you, Bill and Ambassador D, is what ails the Philippines still, despite the raft of legislation and improvements under this administration, and what can be done? Well, uh, let, me, let me just put it in some context first, uh, Quintin. Uh, we, we track 12 reports uh, worldwide. We're up on nine of the 12 over a five-year span of time. So I think the first lesson we need to look at here is that it's important to uh, be consistent and be persistent and to continuously work at it. Uh, and to be able to move up the numbers by that much over five years requires a lot of collaboration between uh, the government and the, and the private sector, so that's number one. So in answer to your question, why do we take uh, drops from, if from one year to the other? Again, that's the second lesson, which is if you get your foot off the gas pedal, 
it's so easy to fall back in the field. So the lesson here is that you have to be constantly hard charging and, 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 and moving ahead. You relax a little bit, you fall back. Even if you move at the same speed, you fall back because it's a competition and people are moving uh, and, and accelerating. So uh, that, that, that's a very important consideration. You can't afford to relax and you can't afford to pat yourself on the back too long. Uh, I always tell people every time we get the upgrade, uh, I give them basically overnight to, to bask in the glory and then the next day it's back to work. Because you just can't say, well, we've done it, we've hit target. Just raise the target and keep on moving. Uh, in a word, what's the problem? Uh, you, you pointed out two indicators, starting a business and enforcing contracts. Starting a business is simply how to incorporate a company. Uh, we take a minimum 16 steps, 34 days to get it done, minimum. And uh, uh, best, best practice, best in the world is a day or less, an hour two hours online. So we have to learn what they're doing and, and, and emulate and copy it. It's not rocket science. They're doing it. Many countries do it, so we, we should be able to do it. Enforcing contracts is what happens when you go to court. So uh, you, anybody who's had the pain of going to court, you know it's a, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, Supreme Court has put in new rules for, for e-courts. It's piloted in, in Quezon City mainly, but it's around the country. But we're focusing on, on a few pilots in Quezon City it's uh, improved. But the lesson here is that when you make an improvement, you can't make an improvement on your own time. You got to make the improvement on the time that uh, the, the rating agencies are looking at you. If they say, have the improvement in by my, May 31st every year, you can't do it on June 2 because it's not good enough. So we keep telling agencies we need to get those you know, reforms in, programs in, and not on paper. They need to be actually working uh, by May 31st uh, every year. So, in a word, if you say what ails us, it's not laws, it's not rules, it's not regulations. It's just implementation. We need to focus on implementation. Implementation is everything in, in this business of getting competitive, and we can't forget it. Well, one thing I would just like to add to your remarks is that taking the gas off the pedal is easy within an administration, but imagine what it's like in a transition between administrations. So, Ambassador D, I'd like you to also comment on the fact that we're at a critical juncture right now and policy continuity tends to be left out when you transition from one administration to another. Tell us what can be done by the outgoing and then the incoming administration. We, we as far as uh, we in PCCI, concern. Uh, on Thursday, we will be presenting a paper to, to the public, which we will uh, push and present to all the uh, candidates so that whoever becomes president, I hope, will adopt the paper, where we are very specific in what has to be done on day one. Having said that, I just want to, again, repeat what uh, uh, Bill has said. You know, we have done a lot of work the past five years, and we have consistently been moving up. But uh, the other countries have not uh, stopped. It's just that maybe last year they moved faster than us. So really, stepping on the pedal, on the gasoline pedal, is really very important. You can't let go. Now, we have in PCCI finished uh, four rounds of consultations with our local chambers. And top of mind, still the problem in the country is uh, really cost of doing business. It is really licensing. It's really impossible to apply for new license, much less, and even just to, ex to renew a mayor's permit is really a nightmare. So I hope that uh, what we have to do is uh, immediately, again going back to what Bill has been trying to do, we, we will have a template and we will then ask all local governments to follow this. And this template should, should be very clear on its target. It shouldn't be a moving target. We must have specific date, specific deadlines. And again, the challenge is implementation. The other thing is in the area of cost of utilities. Here we have done very poorly in the sense that, uh, you know, the last year we, we saw uh, port, uh, the, uh, the problems in the port of Manila. And this has, again, everybody saw that we, it has become very difficult to, to move cargos. The cost is very, very high. So, again, this is another area that we have to, to relook to make our, our industry more competitive. Ambassador, thank you for your point and insights. Now, we move on to...
two specific industries. We've got two industries on both sides of the spectrum. One is on the manufacturing side and the other on the creative industries. Um, Yoshio-san, I would like to get your insights on how manufacturing can be enhanced further, especially in light of the recently launched CARS program of the DTI. Thank you very much. Uh, once we, people are talking about Asian economic integrations, many people are thinking maybe now, especially automobile or several other manufacturing might be only concentrated in Thailand and Indonesia. Then what could be in, uh, in Philippines? And uh, several companies are now enlarging the activity, but either they can really compete against the import of the car from Thailand or Indonesia. That's the people's... Uh, uh, concern. And uh, in order to make this uh, car uh, automobile uh, sector bigger, they, don't, they need not only the assembly company, but the tier one, tier two, tier three companies. So the effect of the uh, integration is much bigger than just only the uh, number of the cars. But considering the present market in Philippines at that time, when we started talk about this one, it was only the market of less than 200,000. Maybe 150 or so, and people are struggling about that. But in these three years, it becomes to the over the 200, and 200, or more than 250, then now over the 300. And it is not a dream to say about half a million anymore. And people are now targeting one million. Under this market, then how much of the production we are uh, doing? It's just 100, 100,000. Then rest of the car people import this one or not? That was a big issue. Then under this discussion going on, there in the real last moment, two days before the, uh, President Akino uh, uh, went to the state visit to Japan, he announced this car's uh, policies. And uh, this policy is not only to make the uh, incentive to the car manufacturer, but they have to invest a lot of money, not only by assembly company, but they have to bring a lot of tier one company and integrate to all other industries. Otherwise, they can't achieve these figures. So, uh, as the Chamber of Commerce, Japanese Chamber of Commerce, we very much appreciated this big decision. This is a kind of the strong will that the Philippine government want to keep manufacturing in Philippines. So now I think that we have to respond on this strong will. And at least uh, the two manufacturers already declared to go into this field. Uh, and I hope that they can uh, make the good success. But not only that, manufacturing is also the one of the core uh, issues for Japanese companies. So uh, it's not only the PESA, but we have to grow up together with domestic market in Philippines. On that point of view, we uh, made the policy note uh, among JFC and uh, publishing and even film. Gunter, what is your perspective in terms of what Arancada has already put out? Rather than reinventing the wheel, you've already recommended in Marang uh, Arancada a Creative Industry Development Council, a master plan, and more robust marketing for the industry. Tell us what else can we do specifically? Well, Quintin, thanks a lot. I think uh, in order to understand creativity or creative industries, let me uh, elaborate a little bit uh, more on it. Can you imagine a hotel lobby, five-star hotel lobby in Hong Kong, in Singapore, without Filipino ent uh, uh, entertainers? Or can you imagine a Broadway show without Filipino talents in it? Uh, and I think it goes on. Can you imagine a celebrity home in, in Hollywood without any furniture from Cebu, from uh, 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 the designer Kobombu? So the facets of creativities are, or creativity is rather wide. And I think in terms of the Filipino uh, uh, talents, it's well deserved and internationally recognized and has a reputation that is unsurpassed by anyone else. Um, having recognized the talents that we have in the country, we now have to move on and say, fine, what do we do with it? And I think the uh, uh, implementation of Republic Act uh, uh, 10557 was the first step in the right direction in order to sort of regulate this whole industry and put a little bit more format onto it. And uh, 
it was done, it was signed by President Aquino in 2013, and uh, it was started to, it was approved finally in late 2015, which should give us now a roadmap on where to move to. Um, the, the way forward here is probably that the industry, first of all, needs to be united because it's still very, very fragmented and not really very organized. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here that has to be recognized and that should be recognized by government and start putting some structure onto the entire thing. Uh, we have a number of points and they are highlighted in the uh, uh, literature that we, had, uh, er, that we had handed out earlier, how we can see that moving forward. But if you look at it in the greater context, the industry itself combined probably employs on the latest study around about 4 million uh, people in the country, so by far surpasses in terms of employment the uh, PPO industry, but has never really been fully recognized. And there's a lot of growth potential in, in all uh, uh, aspects of the industry itself. And if we look at it properly guided, properly organized, it can be the sunshine industry of the future. Thank you, Gunter. We'll get back to you as uh, the audience also asks specific questions. We'll just go back to the front of the queue and ask Senator Kino one specific question. You know, Congress is basically out campaigning. So the legislative function doesn't exactly uh, move forward. But one of the functions of a legislator is also oversight, trying to make sure there's less stovepiping in terms of government agencies, having them come together, let's say the DTI, the DBM, the DOF. How is your role shaping up in terms of looking at how they can synergize further? Yeah, actually, Kintin, in my two and a half years as a senator, I think that's probably one of the more important functions that is not it's not really initially known by people, but uh, your ability to, ability to bring people together, not only on the national level, but even on the local level, is really important no? because a lot of our agencies really work in silos, and a lot of the efforts that um, are important to really fight poverty or get things done really cross-cuts different agencies. So on our level, in our committee, when we invite an interagency, uh, there are times when it's the first time that the private sector gets to talk to the government sector and sometimes some agencies are finally able to settle things among themselves in those hearings. Uh, in fact, the foreign chambers are always, uh, they're, they're my suke in the hearings, no? Um, but even on the local level, for example, in the negotiation center, when there's a farmer entrepreneur, uh, the, the first person they talk to in the, in the negotiation center is DTI. But very soon, you find that they probably need help from DA, from DAR, from DOST, uh, even from smaller agencies like PCA, the Philippine Coconut Authority, and so on and so forth. Um, they're probably also members of the four piece. So it's practically all the agencies now. And what we find is that the successful models where people get out of poverty is where there's a convergence of efforts. And um, at times, it just needs someone to bring people together for this to actually happen. Um, sometimes it's a very progressive local government unit. Sometimes it's um, someone from my office when we work through the negotiation centers. Other times, it's the Chamber of Commerce. No? The, the local chambers of commerce have clout to actually convene um, different groups. No? So it's really important. And, um, more and more as our problems become, are, are actually more complex and we need to have more complex solutions to the complex problems, that multi-stakeholder approach becomes more and more important. And usually, if the private sector is there, uh, usually represented by the chamber or, or sometimes the Go Negotio group or, or other groups, um, if they can have a voice on the table and the agencies are willing to listen and willing to work with each other, you can expect good solutions. But if it's just one agency, helping one person, uh, there's a lot of duplication and inefficiency that happens. And usually, the support you're able to give is not the complete support that they actually need. So you're absolutely right. It's very important to, to get those groups together. Now, if I can uh, ask this question before opening up uh, to the audience. One of the things about the new administration is different leadership styles are going to create a government that may be wholly different from the one we have right now. When you talk about stovepipes and lack of synergy, one of the things you look at is how the executive puts together these cabinet clusters and these uh, thematic areas to make sure that you actually get what the private sector needs and create inclusive development. What do you think is the most optimal way for the next executive to get these agencies together, this vast complex of 
cabinet agencies to work better together. I'm going to take a stab at this because this is a pet peeve of mine. No? Um, in other countries, the Department of Education and the Department for Employment are usually under one roof or very closely coordinated because you want the pipeline from the students all the way to the workforce to be complete. Um, the Department of Environment and the Department of Energy uh, in other countries is also under one roof sometimes, no? Because uh, to produce energy, you need to, have, uh, you need to have that lens of the environment as well. The, the Department of Trade, International Trade, and the Department of Foreign Affairs in other countries is also sometimes under one roof. Because uh, your foreign affairs, uh, you're, although of course with us, our direct linkage is usually through the OFW stones, labor, but in other countries, they put the trade offices and the foreign affairs together because that's the main investment, linkage, investment yeah. linkage to other countries. So um, you actually see models where things aren't as uh, siloed and they cross-cut. But let me just say, even if we were to do that, the real coordination needs to happen three or four levels below the secretary. At the director level? <laughs> or even uh, below or even that. lower, no? Yeah. Because the secretaries talk to each other and you have cabinet clusters, no? which, which actually work. But when, when those policies are translated to implementation, uh, on the ground, you still have offices which are physically separate, who have different um, KPIs, no? key performance indicators, for each of these agencies. And I'm not certain, and I could be wrong, if there are KPIs where you're forced to cross-cut agencies. I think most of the KPIs are uh, single agency KPIs. No? But if there were actually indicators that uh, could cross-cut, and you could build in the system to actually um, have that convergence or interaction built in to how people are assessed and even to their bonuses, etc., etc. I think that would be a more practical step to trying to get the different groups to, to talk to each other more. Yeah, so smoothen overlaps and create more synergies. Bill, I mean, you sit on both, uh, you know, you have your feet in both sectors. Tell us. Yeah, I want to echo what, uh, what the senator said. No, I think uh, because the cabinet departments and the ministries are, are siloed, uh, the opportunity lies in creating some interagency work. Uh, if you can't collapse them under one roof, and I think it's too difficult to reorganize government uh, overnight, you can create interagency groups. NCC is such an interagency group. We, we work with all agencies, uh, and we try to work all the way down to local government level, meaning regional director level of DTI or NEDA or, or Department of uh, Interior uh, and, and others. And we find that very effective. Uh, the other thing I would say is that in the interagency groups, I would uh, suggest that the government invite in more private sector into the agencies on, a, on an institutional basis and maybe rotate it through different groups and spread out the, uh, the composition or the membership in, uh, across different groups. The reason is that many of the solutions can come from the people who are complaining about the problems, and I, I think they know what's going on. One thing I would caution against is trying to say, let's make it all a con complete private sector group trying to solve the problems. Uh, they will identify the problems really quickly, and a session like that can, can degenerate into a complaint session. But if there's nobody on the other side working with them from government who can actually provide a solution, meaning they can implement it, I think we'll not get too far. But on the other hand, if you have just a government or interagency uh, committee, and they're not listening to the private sector in the room, giving them uh, potential, uh, well, giving them the feedback and then the potential solutions, it will take too long to arrive you know, at the solution. So uh, I think I would say let's go interagency and let's mix it up a little in terms of bringing uh, private sector uh, people uh, on board these, uh, these committees. You'll solve problems much, much, much faster. Now, the key here is the cabinet has to step in at the right moment because you're right, they can decide, but if they don't crack the whip, people down below don't really move. So again, we've had this problem, and uh, when we run into that roadblock, we just have to tell the cabinet secretary, look, we need your help to step in because if you don't crack the whip all the way down, things won't happen. And I do know that when they step in, things do happen. Ambassador Yee, would you like to add to that? I just want to say that this interagency group, such as uh, NCC, Export Development Council, uh, and now uh, the DTI has organized the Industrial Development Council, these are the best venue. Just as an example, last week, uh, the problem of uh, the salt law, as in law, was thrown into my lap. You know, and uh, 
lo and behold, when I was reading it, every, all the agencies were telling me, you know, the, the law itself is faulty. I read through the law, and it wasn't. It was very clear that you have to ionize salt for food purposes. But it doesn't say all salt. But the FDA was implementing all salt. So, and nobody in government wanted to take leadership. So it fell on my lap. So I created uh, a technical working group and uh, with DTI, with FDA, and, uh, and we started working on the IRR. And after four years, it was left pending four years. The law was passed four years ago. Just they couldn't solve it because the agencies refused to talk with, them, with each other. Anyway, we were able to uh, release a new IRR, and now we have no problem. So again, it is, we need the support of the cabinet member to really tell their people below them that they should actively participate in this interagency. Oh, those are good case studies. And I, I actually wanted to share one of mine. Uh, I used to work at the National Security Council, and Dr. Alan Ortiz was there also. And one of the stories we had with President Ramos, who was here earlier, was that he would lock cabinet secretaries and undersecretaries in a room and put the air conditioning off until they create the consensus. Uh, hopefully, there will be enough mechanisms to come in the next administration so we have to avoid that leadership trait coming in with the next president. I think Alan will agree. Now, uh, Yoshi Osan and uh, Gunter, is there anything else you want to add before I open? the floor to questions. Okay. So um, we have a very rich panel, robust insights, and a good discussion already. I'd like to get questions. We have around a room for three or four. Uh, so please feel free to come to the mics and uh, state your name, designation, and your question. Are we still in post-coma, <laughs> post-lunch coma? <laughs> It was a good lunch. <laughs> Architect Palafox. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I used to work for a foreign government, Dubai. All permits were, were granted in one day. And if the signatory has any objection, he has to justify within two weeks whether there's a his objection is justifiable. Otherwise, the permit is given. And the ruler of Dubai, we used to tell, what is good for business is good for the country. Can we do that here? And that's why corruption happens. Let's say in real estate, you borrowed one billion pesos. Every day of delay, how much is the cost of money? So it's cheaper to bribe than the cost of money. Thank you. Gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, actually, it can happen. The, it can, this can be fixed. And, and I want to go back to your question, uh, Kintin, about transition, you know, and people are always saying, well, we're going to tr have a transition from one administration to the other. So what? Okay, so what? Because actually, if we have a manual of operations and everyone just sticks and enforces, you know, the rules and follows that manual, then things should flow. So I think what we need to do and concentrate here is, in fact, put as much of these types of activities, this process, into a manual of operations and make those very public. Okay, so that requires, of course, it sounds easy, but it's not. This requires some simplification. This requires streamlining. Uh, most people think right away, let's go to automation. Uh, I always say, let's not automate, because if you automate something that's uh, not simple, something that's very complicated and not streamlined, uh, it's an expensive job and it won't get the job done anyway. So I always say we got to go down and boil things down to their simplest, uh, most streamlined version of it, eliminating steps if we have to, and then automate the, uh, the remaining steps. So in, in your example, June, in, in Dubai, I'm sure there's a very set rule and a very strong penalty for the person who's not following that is exactly what we need to have happen here. And we need to make these rules extremely transparent. But if it's just a private complaint, you know, meaning something we hear in cocktail reception conversation, uh, that's not going to make it to the institutionalization stage. What happens is that that's got to get, that's why I like private sector people inside interagency committees, because the bigger they, you know, the bigger the pain in the neck they are, uh, things can happen. 
anybody you know who experienced the problem with the uh, the movement of chemicals i mean in the last few months will know that until we got a lot of complaints those agencies particularly one who was providing all the escort and security services they did not pay attention until everyone complained you have to raise the noise level but in an institutionalized fashion rather than just raise the noise level but not provide any solutions Dr. Ortiz, and then we'll have the lady um, in the center table. I asked this question from Senator Bam four weeks ago. I want to ask this question to Bill Luce. We now have a new competitive uh, anti-competition council. Uh, last October, Open Source, which is a, a research group, studied the 162 countries in terms of the quality of their broadband. We ranked 162 out of 162. The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University last November studied the infrastructure quality, the quality of telecoms infrastructure of 50 countries globally. We were number 47. We know the spiel. With this new law, can you, Bill, be brave enough to tell Jaza that Globe and Smart are not doing the country a service, that they are among the top five leading GSM companies in the world year after year after year, most profitable, and yet the Filipino people are being shortchanged by the duopoly that they hold with Smart. We are all suffering for it. We're 162 out of 162, 47 out of 50. Can you apply the competitiveness law, the anti-competitiveness law in this case? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Alan. Uh, first, uh, just for, for clarity's sake, uh, there's the NCC and there's the Philippine Competition Commission. Uh, it's the Philippine Competition Commission which is going to be taking on those types of, uh, of cases. Okay? Uh, the NCC looks at a, a country level competitiveness and, and uh, the uh, Philippine uh, Competition Commission will look at the, uh, what's happening in the business arena. But you are correct. I think if we take a look at the, the purpose, I think, of looking at all these uh, indices is to find out precisely where the country is, uh, is weak. And uh, telecom is one of them. Uh, we were weak in infrastructure. Uh, we were weak in airports, ports, rail. Uh, we were weak in many areas. And we ignore those numbers at our own peril. If we do not, if we choose to do nothing about the numbers, we will continue to remain very low in, the, um, uh, in, in any of the global tables. So, it is important for all of us to pay attention to it. And when I say all of us, it's not the government's uh, exclusive responsibility to look at that. It's also the, the companies themselves which have to look at it. So that's an industry that definitely needs fixing, and it has a lot of knock-on effects on what will happen uh, to the rest of the economy. Uh, not only the, you know, the economy is really very much an internet-based economy, or an information uh, or knowledge-based economy, but this has an impact on everything else, including uh, education and the delivery of basic services. So definitely we have to uh, improve in our uh, internet and, and telecommunication services. Uh, any other gentleman from the panel would like to respond? Senator. Yeah. I'll, I'll say my answer four weeks ago as well, which is it's a competition issue. We need to get more players in. Uh, I think Remember our conversation, I think the third player is, has decided to actually come in, and that already is affecting the market positively. Now, the question is, are there more players who are going to enter this market? Um, a few days after our meeting in um, Foundation for Economic Freedom, we actually passed a franchise for another telco, which is Avocado Telecom, which is actually the telco of... Um, run by uh, former Senator June Magsaysay. And that's actually with the cable operators in Central and North Luzon. 
So it could be another player that we're looking at. In the arm area, they have their own NTC there. And they are actually starting to put up a, a, a broadband network in the arm area, I think coming from Malaysia or coming from Brunei. Um, and they're boasting to us that the arm area will have the fastest internet in the Philippines, no? faster than Metro Manila. Now, my take is we need to allow more players to come in. With more players coming in, you'll have better competition and the market will respond. That's the number one solution, I think. Now, the question is, where are these players being stopped? Where are they stopped in their tracks? Is it providing franchises from Congress and the Senate? And we know that there are a lot of issues there. Is it the permits from NTC? Is it the permits from the local government units? It's all of these all together. And if we're talking about ease of doing business, this is the best test case, no? Uh, every step of the way, there's someone trying to stop you from getting your permits and your ability to actually transact. And during our hearings, we're actually looking very closely at that. And it's become an open forum for all of the players, uh, people who want to come in and the current players to actually talk about where these um, obstacles are. And we're committed to at least take a second, third, fourth, fifth look to make sure that these obstacles, which of course are corruption issues, are actually hurdled very quickly uh, by these new players. Because again, the way I see it, no? the only way to really improve that industry is to allow more players to come in and allow the market to respond accordingly. Uh, ever since a third player was supposed to come in or the announcement was made, um, our friends here from Asia Foundation are also here, I saw them, no? Uh, their analysis is that 40, prices went down 40%. So I don't know if the speed went up, no? but at least prices already went down. No? And that's because of competition. So when Arancada actually pushed this for a number of years, no? pushing for the Competition Act, pushing for more competitive, uh, more competitive environment, we can see that in the telco industry, it's already being affected. And we're hoping more players can come in, and that competition will be good for, for Filipino consumers. Bill? One more post here. Yeah, uh, well, well uh, to add to what Bam was saying, uh, a lot of this goes back to uh, regulations that have, are either in place or misinterpreted for various reasons. So, as you said, at every chain of the permit process, someone is stopping you. Uh, for this reason, one of the projects we are launching is called Project Repeal, which is to try to identify all these laws, rules, regulations at the executive level, in Congress, and in, uh, at the LGU level, which are either irrelevant, detrimental to the economy, outdated, uh, what have you, uh, have some negative effect on the economy. And I think we need to have that systematically identified and then systematically repealed. And I, I have met several times with, with Senator Bam and his staff and, and with the private sector because this is one of these actions that requires both the private sector and the government to be able to identify and then remove. So uh, if you have something that you, you feel, you have an idea that you feel should be uh, studied for repeal, contact us at project.repeal at competitive.org.ph. And uh, we'll, we're beginning, and I, I was just telling Donald, we've already received uh, the first three or four recommendations from the uh, from, uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and others, so that we're beginning to uh, uh, stockpile all these and put them to a technical group and study how to repeal these things as fast as we can. Bill, thank you. We have room for one quick question. Dr. Claudio, you had a question. I enjoy the lunch very much that I have to make these comments, but it's not quick. I have three points. One is uh, competitiveness in the ASEAN community. We may not be able to be competitive uh, in producing engineered products, but we can be in engineered manpower. Unfortunately, you know, I just came from the annual convention of the Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers, and that is a big issue. Although we have the mutual recognition agreement, none of our schools is in the top 10 
engineering schools in ASEAN. None. No? Singapore, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, 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 none from the Philippines. And we can help here. One reason for this is that we do not have good facilities in our engineering schools. And what we can do is the private sector can provide uh, uh, access to their facilities so that the academe and uh, the universities can work together to address this issue. Number two, I, I think in uh, coming up with systems and procedures, we practice what I call self-flagellation, you know. Uh, example, uh, I don't know who are senior citizens here, but I think most of us are now. What do we need this booklet for? when we want to enjoy the sit, uh, senior citizen uh, discount. I never bring my booklet, and so I end up always giving a lecture about it. It does not serve any purpose, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the malls tell me uh, they are monitoring it. And when I ask, you know, your POS does not even include it, uh, then they say DTI is monitoring it. Oh, uh, uh. Is somebody from the DTI here? Nobody is monitoring it, and yet we keep on doing it. What a waste of paper and time. Lastly, uh, if we want to be competitive, I think we have to look at wow, what is really our competitive natural resource advantage. We are at the center of marine biodiversity in the world, yet our fisher folks are the poorest of the poor. When we talk about agri, we talk about land-based agri most of the time. We hardly talk about marine-based agri. Okay, so... Dr. Lally, thank you. And again, this is an ongoing discussion. A lot of the gentlemen will be here towards the end of the session, so they'll be here to answer your questions some more. Let's give a round of applause to our panel, and thanks for a robust discussion. Thank you very much, dear panelists. May we ask you to please pose for a souvenir photo? We'd like to remind everyone to kindly complete the evaluation forms that we have placed on your tables. We'll be collecting them at the end of the conference. We appreciate it if you would kindly give us your feedback. Many thanks for everyone who joined our panel on becoming more competitive. For our sixth and last panel that talks about minimizing bureaucracy, maximizing governance, we have the Senior Advisor of the American Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Please welcome Mr. John Forbes. Quentin, you left your uh, program up here. Uh, John Forbes, American Chamber. It's uh, great to be up here again today to introduce what is one of the most important discussions that we're having here today, uh, and that is minimizing bureaucracy and maximizing governance. So this panel is being asked to identify bold policies and programs to reduce corruption, regulatory burdens, and, the other, and to otherwise improve public and private sector governance during the next decade. We've entitled the, pro, uh, the panel Minimizing Bureaucracy and Maximizing Governance, which means efficiency of government services, making them cost less in terms of our time and expense without corruption and supporting the private sector through strong institutions. The World Economic Forum states that the efficiency of government has a significant bearing on a country's competitiveness and economic growth. Excessive bureaucracy and regulation, lack of transparency, and inadequate legal frameworks all impose additional costs on business and impede expansion. Now, the good news is that the Philippines, unlike in broadband that we just heard from Mr. Or, uh, Dr. Ortiz, is not the least efficient government 
out of the 140 ranked by the World Economic Forum. That distinction goes to Venezuela, Brazil, and Italy. However, two ASEAN economies, Singapore and Malaysia, are the first and sixth most efficient. Now, hopefully there's a slide going up here, but if not, it's on page 226 of your assessment. Oh, there it is, right behind me. I can't see it. I'll turn around. Um, wrong slide. This happened to me last year. Uh, the slide is a slide on the burden of government regulations. Ah, here we am. I have two slides here. I'm talking about the one on the right. The burden of government... 140 countries, and the Philippines is ranked, where do you think? 101st. Lowest of the ASEAN 6. So if you're an investor, you might take this into account. Where is the cost of paperwork? Moving all that paper around town in traffic, where is it going to be worst? So where, where's Bill Luce? Bill still here? Bill wants to get into the top one-third in WEF overall ranking, but this particular one with the Philippines is, is, uh, is red, is, is we are got to get over the next couple of levels and get higher up. And the slide immediately behind me is similar. It's the burden of customs procedures, where it's slightly worse, not better, 107th. However, it's gotten better than it was a few years ago. So there's a lot of work to be done in, in, in minimizing the bureaucracy. Why is Indonesia so far ahead? I thought it was super bureaucratic. So a bold reform for the Philippines would be to rank near the midpoint of ASEAN 6, which would be 55th, not 101st for government regulation, and 62nd, not 107 for customs procedure. So there's a goal for the next decade. It's bold, but it can be done is to get up to the top third, get to the ASEAN midpoint. We have the technology, but e-governance has barely begun. For 10 years, we've been trying to get a Department of ICT. We heard that advocated by Bobby Romulo earlier today. Let's not talk about it anymore. The bill is going to the president, and we appeal to the president to create a DICT in this administration. But minimizing bureaucracy will not stop major corruption. For that, you need to maximize governance. You have to strengthen two of the most important Philippine constitutional agencies, the Office of the Ombudsman and the Commission on Audit. So now I want to call our speakers and panelists and moderator. And we're very honored that the speaker is Conchita Carpio Morales, Ombudsman of the Republic of the Philippines. Ma'am, if you would come to the States, please. She is a graduate of the UP College of Law. The Ombudsman pursued a career as attorney, prosecutor, judge, and Supreme Court justice. And we remember her for administering the oath of office to President Aquino and Vice President Binai in 2010. After retiring from the Supreme Court, she took on her present challenge. Now, I want to look up another, one more slide here. It is from Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. Is that slide available? Because in that, it's, the Philippines has moved up 39 ranks from 134th in 2010 to 95th in 2015 of the 177 countries. It's clustered. That slide's way over there and over there. So you see the clusters on the right-hand side of the slide, and you'll see that Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam, and the Philippines are all within 20 or 30 ranks of each other. So there, I think, for the Philippines to get the midpoint of that if you can continue better governance in the next 
two administrations is quite achievable. Now let me invite our four panelists to come up here, please. Michael G. Aguinaldo, chairperson, a recent chairperson of the Commission on Audit, like the Ombudsman, one of the toughest jobs in government. is a successful lawyer, has taken on the daunting task of overseeing the large network of auditors who check out public officials, spend the money that we pay in taxes. Welcome, welcome, Your Honor. And a well-known figure who gave us a keynote speech at the beginning of last year's Arancata is the chairman of the Makati Business Club, Mr. Ramon de Rosario. He's here in his capacity today as chairman of the steering committee of the Integrity Initiative. And we have a prominent educator, Dr. Jesus P. Stanislao, who was a finance secretary under President Corazon Aquino, and for many years has been chairman of the Institute of Solidarity for Asia, and is known for training corporate directors and government agencies in ethics. Jess? And finally, on the panel, civil society leader Vincent Lazatine, who's the executive director of Transparency and Accountability Network, a vicious anti-corruption watchdog. Are you vicious today, Vince? He calls it as he sees it. And our moderator, she is an Aaron Cotta veteran who we recognize as a media personality who has given generously of her time for five Aaron Cotta for us since 2012. Ms. Maria Ressa is CEO and executive editor of our media partner, Rappler, and a force on social media with nearly 300,000 followers on... Are you tweeting now? Already? She tweets while she moderates. It's amazing. So let me first of all call the Ombudsman up to give her remarks, which we greatly look forward to because we're very, very supportive of your activities and of increasing your power so you can do even more faster, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Your honors, esteemed officials and members of the joint foreign chambers of the Philippines, distinguished guests, colleagues in the government service, friends, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon. I have to speak fast because I'm given a few minutes to deliver my piece. This day and age, we can find answers to every question at the blink of the eye, so that they say through the information superhighway. In truth, the speed of finding the answer depends on the available internet brands with. Still, we get the data we get, we want, or search for far, way faster and easier now than during the card catalog and encyclopedia days, even with regard to topics of serious concern. Trying to find out what are the major problems in the Philippine bureaucracy from Yahoo Answers, for instance, immediately leads us to this simple yet matter-of-fact result. First, it is too bloated. Some are hard, not because their work is a necessity, but sadly for political accommodation. Worst, some do not even meet the minimum qualification of the position. Second, inefficiency. Government remuneration is not competitive with the private sector. Hence, there is less incentive for public servants to work with more efficiency. Third is corruption. Because of the small pay, many people are tempted to commit petty graft by stealing, by stealing a ream of paper or other supplies. The higher the office, of course, the greater the corruption. While web content is usually suspect because anyone from anywhere can put basically anything in the internet, it can be verified from official sources or validated by our own experience about the matter. The Civil Service Commission website reports that the number of government employees grew at a faster rate than that of the Philippine population from 1960 to 1997, that the population grew 160% between those periods but total government personnel more than doubled in size from the 360,000 employed in 1960. That in 1970, 
the ratio of government personnel to the total population was 1 is to 90, and that by 1990, the ratio stood at 1 is to 52. From the latest inventory conducted by the CSC in the second quarter of 2010, the total number of government personnel was 1,312,508. The Philippine population as of the same period, or May 2010, according to official census data, meanwhile, was 92, thank you, 0.34 million. More recently thus, the ratio of government personnel to the total population was roughly 1 is to 70. Indeed, the sheer size of the Philippine government personnel lends some firm basis for the popular perception of a bloated bureaucracy. As to efficiency, the experience of many citizens who come into contact with first-level bureaucrats responsible for processing requests for services or assistance is quite telling. Their stories are usually not pleasant. Surely all of us here have heard some of those horror tales. There could be a truism that paying reasonable wages to government employees can inspire them to work more efficiently and encourage talented, hard-working people to enter and remain in the civil service. Receiving far better pay alone, however, does not guarantee better performance or less incidence of corruption in the government. Other factors, which I will discuss later, must thus come into play for us to have that assurance. Speaking of corruption, the term is so attached with bureaucracy that they have become almost synonymous. Admittedly, corruption is already entrenched in our culture and systems that we wage not a battle but a war against it. Our enemies have different faces. They could be low-ranking employees or high-ranking officials of the land. They wreak havoc in different territories, local government units, executive departments, courts, legislative chambers, government corporations, and even constitutional bodies. They employ different means of attack from illegal facilitation of, facilitation of processes to manipulation of contracts to big-time malversation of funds. The damages run by the billions, but the biggest hit is on our faces, including those of the innocent ones. The reality is that corruption masks the good and honest performance of majority of the public servants. That spawns the question, what have we done to address corruption and inefficiencies in government with the end in view of improving the standards of public service and enhancing bureaucratic performance. My answer is, uh, we have done a lot as a nation. We have had hits and misses. The thing is, if we are in a war, we need to keep our eyes always focused on the ultimate goal and not be distracted by the result of each and every battle we face. In other words, we could lessen the incidence and impact of corruption if we continuously strive to improve the bureaucracy. In their paper entitled, The Bureaucracy and Governance in 16 Developing Countries, including the Philippines, Goran Hayden, Julius Court, and Ken Meese identify five of the most important determinants of bureaucratic performance, and these are influence, meritocracy, accountability, transparency, and access. On influence, Hayden, Court, and me suggest that civil servants, I was distracted by looking at the remaining time, civil servants, not the politicians or the technocrats, should have the most important role in the process of make policy making. The reason is that civil servants are the most sensitive to public interests and most knowledgeable about issues in the service. After all, policy implementation in the end boils down to what street-level bureaucrats decide to do. On meritocracy, the authors go on to suggest that the government recruitment system should be more competitive and merit-based. Political interference or dependence on personal ties should have no place in civil service appointments. Otherwise, the hiring will likely result in people without training or experience getting to fill high posts, and it will breed a sense of unfairness and discontent, thereby adversely affecting the whole regime on which the government rests. Merit criteria in appointment and promotion are important for the credibility of civil service. Moreover, the analysis reveals that countries with merit-based bureaucracy perform better 
and have lower corruption level and higher efficiency in their service delivery and provide a better framework for the private sector. On accountability, the authors state that civil servants often have a degree of discretion in their work and that the way they implement rules and provide services can have significant impact on citizens. As such, systems of accountability need to be set up to reduce corruption or other forms of abuse of public officers. The establishment of institutional mechanisms such as the Anti-Corruption Commission, a special administrative court, and an ombudsman that aim to hold bureaucrats publicly accountable is, however, just the first step. The real challenge is to ensure that these bodies have teeth and they can use them. On transparency, the authors opine that uh, clear rules and openness reduce risk of misuse of public office. If the public is not adequately informed of how decisions are made, this adversely affects the image of the bureaucracy. To the authors, transparency involves an attitudinal change, not just among the bureaucrats, but among politicians and the public at large. Lastly, on access, the authors state that equal access to public service is important. Urban residents should not be favored over their rural counterparts. The better off in society should not have privileged access to services just because they can pay bribes. The authors acknowledge that geography, democracy, and social stratification coincide to make greater equality in access to public services a very complicated and costly issue. Of these five determinants, however, the authors find out that transparency and accountability proved to be the indicators where there is really some evidence of correlation of performance, such that if both transparency and accountability is low, service performance is rated low. If either transparency or accountability are low and the other is rated high, service performance is likely to be a medium low range. And if both transparency and accountability are medium, service performance is also rated medium. This finding indicates that bureaucratic reforms must focus more on increasing transparency and accountability in the service in order to be effective. The Office of the Ombudsman is keenly aware of the importance of factoring in these two elements in its own reform initiatives vis-a-vis -vis its functions to prevent corruption, promote high standards of ethics and efficiency in the government. In line with this, the, the Ombudsman has initiated programs and projects. One, enhancing the income and assets declaration system in the country by improving the effectiveness of the system of filing and analyzing statements of assets, liabilities, and net worth. Two, initiating the integrity caravan to actively engage the people in the barangays and schools in the war against corruption under a multimedia platform for information dissemination. Communication activities are conducted not merely to make the people aware of the anti-corruption programs of the government. The far greater objective is to make them vigilant of and report instances of graft and corruption. Three, instituting a system for active handling of public feedback and redress of grievance to ensure compliance with the standards of public delivery of services and to prompt concerned officers to take sufficient and proper measures under existing rules and regulations and guidelines. Four, monitoring the performance of not only the ombudsman, but also other key government agencies through the integrity management program, which enables the office to review and assess the systems and processes of public institutions in terms of risks and vulnerabilities to corruption, and to recommend corrective and preventive measures to the heads of agencies, or if warranted. Five, conducting an integrity, transparency, and accountability in public service, or ITAPS program, through a training facility under the National Integrity Center, the education and training arm of the Office of the Ombudsman that utilizes the latest information and communication technology. Six, developing the Ombudsman website, not only to provide the latest news and relevant information about our anti-corruption work, but also to introduce online filing of complaints and online application of ombudsman services. Seven, reviving the environmental ombudsman program to ensure the 
proper implementation and enforcement of the environmental laws and handle complaints against public officer, officers and employees for violations of environmental laws. And lastly, and a particular relevance to the business sector, establishing the investment ombudsman program to encourage local and foreign investments in the country and improve global competitiveness through prompt action on investor-related grievances and speedy resolution of complaints of investors. The program ensures that licensure and other business regulatory mechanisms conform to a speedy system that is free from delay, fraud, bribery, and red tape. It provides an accessible venue for the redress of grievance in the processing of business permits, licenses, and other investment-related government services. It also encourages the immediate reporting of corrupt and inefficient practices. This month, the office will conduct a multi-sectoral integrity forum focusing on the investment ombudsman program. Reforms take time to be fully implemented and even take a longer period to have an impact on development outcomes. The important thing is we are aware of the problems in the bureaucracy and we are doing something to minimize it. The key to making sure that reforms work is to engage all the stakeholders in the process, especially those from within the government interagency. Cooperation is crucial given that bureaucratic problems and issues are perceived as increasingly cutting across administrative jurisdictions. Building an anti-graft network within the bureaucracy, the Ombudsman formed partnership with such agencies as the Department of Education for youth sector initiatives, the Department of Interior and local government for projects with local government units, the Department of Justice for the prosecution of graft cases, and the Securities and Exchange Commission for corporate sector engagements, among other things. The Ombudsman also developed cooperation ties with foreign institutions, such as the Government Inspectorate of Vietnam, the National Anti-Corruption Commission of Thailand, and the World Bank. A Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, with the Public Prosecutor's Office of the Chilean Government is currently being considered. Moreover, the Ombudsman has taken the lead in ensuring that the country is complying with its obligations under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, or UNCAC. Change is on the way. We are gradually graining ground in our efforts to increase transparency and accountability in public service. The recent decision of the Supreme Court in Morales versus Court of Appeals abandoned the controversial condemnation doctrine, removing the shield from, that protects local officials from being accountable for their administrative infractions while in office. The steady flow of complaints filed with the Ombudsman indicates that the public is aware of corruption and is able to discern when civil servants need to be accountable. It also indicates the public's trust in the system. We do our best, of course, to resolve the complaints on time, and we hope that the case docket would decrease over time on account of enhanced bureaucratic performance. To continuously seek the improvement of the bureaucracy is a sign of good governance. Former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan once said that good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting development. Bureaucratic performance, therefore, is important for development performance. The challenge is for agencies, public agencies, to aspire to become leaner, more efficient, and to bring services closer to the people while ensuring strict adherence to the principles of transparency and accountability. This way, we can minimize bureaucracy and maximize governance. Finally, I want to underscore that we are bound to fail no matter how good our collective intentions are in improving the bureaucracy and governance if we do not put office leaders of unquestioned integrity. Integrity is the soul of a leader. Without it, one cannot be true to one's thought, to one's expression, and to one's deed. Thus, we must choose very, very wisely the people that we want to lead us. Thank you for your kind attention.
so much. Thank you, Ombudsman. Uh, can, I, can I quickly just follow up, Ombudsman, with a question in terms of, you talked about the leader now. Uh, pandemic corruption doesn't happen in a vacuum, and you talked about what you're doing in the Ombudsman's office, but how would you define corruption in our society today? Value system. I had um, told you before, Maria, that corruption is super present. I emphasize the word corruption. It would be a hypocrisy on my part to say that it is not super, given the fact that um, every now and then, incidents of corruption are brought to the attention of the office. But we are trying our best to minimize it. We're trying our best to see to it that the corrupt get their due in court or are administratively uh, punished, but we are also trying to see to it that those who are charged of corruption but turn out to be innocent should be spared. Fantastic. Thank you. Let me ask our panel both for their reaction to the Ombudsman's speech and then your own assessment of the level of corruption in, in the field that you're working at. Let's start at the furthest end with COA. <laughs> Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, there is a great degree of corruption, and uh, I don't think this is uh, something that you can necessarily compare with the past because in the last six years, you've really seen a lot of disclosure, a lot of discovery, which you probably never had before. Uh, case in point, if you look at the PDAF scandal, this actually happened 2007 to 2009. Right. So it actually happened before, but it's uncovered um, only in 2013, and, and really when, when um, uh, the uh, Nepalis issue was, was brought to light. So there, there is quite a degree of corruption, but I've always maintained that corruption uh, can't be eliminated, but it can be tamed. But the most important thing is you have to have a signal from the top. If your uh, leader is someone who is honest, who is... Um, not corrupt, and who uh, carries a perception that he is not corrupt, then in most cases, the bureaucracy will follow suit. Not everyone, of course, but it sends a signal down to the bureaucracy level that corruption is in countenance. Thank you. Jess, you've been working at this for decades and decades. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we're very much fighting against corruption but we approach the issue from the other side, and that is by promoting good governance. It is positive, and it attracts many more people to your cause than if you're simply fighting against corruption. So in good governance, what we've done in the corporate sector, John was presenting all sorts of charts about ASEAN, but uh, last November, we were able to show that Philippine corporations are actually number two in ASEAN uh, in terms of corporate governance. Uh, we beat Singapore to the surprise of the Singaporeans and we beat Malaysia to the surprise of the Malaysians. The only country that was ahead of us was Thailand. That's from the corporate side. It takes two to tango and what we're doing in effect is working institution by institution and city by city, applying all of the principles which our ombudsman was presenting, and we go deep. And we found out, Reza, that in fact, there are three things that are absolutely necessary. We talk about leadership and a shared vision. You've got to get people to dream together. And dreaming together means that they're willing to commit to do something about that dream. So that's sharing of responsibility, winning of stakeholder support, both within and outside. Just to give you a very specific example, our Banco Central Lang Filipinas is one of those wonderful examples of good governance. They've done very well. They've been recognized internationally. But what have they done? It's a shared dream and a shared responsibility. Almost everybody in a BSP follows a certain strategy and what their contribution is to that strategy. And third, very important, what the Ombudsman was saying, You've got to make sure that, in fact, it's a shared value. 
So the shared value of integrity, the shared value of committing to public service. And we have various examples of this, both in local government units and national government agencies. Our challenge now, in addition to what the Ombudsman was saying, is how do you scale this up? How do you embed it into the system so that it is not just a couple of institutions here and there, it's not just a couple of cities here and there, but that, in fact, it's the entire bureaucracy that gets to be affected by the good principles and good practices of governance. Thank you. Private sector, thank you so much for that. Please. First, let me say that uh, the work that the Ombudsman is doing is absolutely remarkable and, is, and really deserves our admiration and our appreciation, and also the Commission on Audit. <laughs> Corruption. Corruption will continue in our society, but clearly over the last five years, we have made great headway. Our contribution in the private sector, among other things, is through something we call the Integrity Initiative. And the whole idea of the Integrity Initiative is exactly what Jess was talking about. The idea that the pursuit of um, integrity, a culture of integrity, has to be a shared vision and a shared mission, which means that the private sector has a role to play. There is corruption, as we all know, in the private sector as well. And it is not fair for us to push government to clean up their ranks if we will not do our part in cleaning up our own ranks. That's what the Integrity Initiative strives to do, which is to create a sort of a mass movement, a critical mass of companies who believe that it is worth our while to try and instill a culture of integrity within our own ranks. It starts with a simple pledge. It moves on to a self-appraisal system, and then it moves forward into what we call uh, a certification system. And what we're hoping will happen in the next administration, in the next decade, is more appreciation from the government also of the efforts that are being undertaken by the private sector. And what do I mean by this? The Department of Public Works and Highways, for example, has shown as a good example the idea that there accepting and embracing the idea of an integrity initiative and they're now requiring anyone who wants to do business with the Department of Public Works and Highways to sign up, sign an integrity pledge. The Department of Education has also done this in terms of their suppliers. Those who wish to locate in PESA, in Subic and in Clark are also requiring their locators to participate in this effort. We are hoping that there will be more and more companies that will appreciate this. But at the end of the day, uh, if government really shows its appreciation by requiring more and more companies that wish to do business with the government to participate in this effort, and even recognizing them to the extent of perhaps giving some in incentives in terms of blue lanes and green lanes, facilitating the movement of goods, for example, through customs, or reducing the amount of harassment or scrutiny in things like uh, internal revenue uh, reviews and that kind of thing, Recognizing good behavior, I guess is what we're saying, and, and making, it, making it stick will, will allow us to expand this effort even more. So I guess the point I'm making is this is an effort that we started five years ago. We've gained a lot of traction. Something like 2,700 companies have already signed up, but we think there's a lot more that we need to do. Some of them have gone to the next stage of self-appraisal and the next stage of certification will follow. But it's a process that we're undertaking in conjunction with the efforts of the government. And I fully agree that for efforts like this to continue, we must select the right leaders looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Vince, Transparency International, your assessment. Um, well, you know, we're, we're winding down the Aquino administration, and it's a good time to start looking back at what's happened over the last five and a half years. And I think one of the things that we all sort of would acknowledge is that at the very top levels, we haven't seen any scandals break out. Um, during the time of Arroyo, every day there was something coming out in the newspapers. Today, what comes out in the newspapers occasionally is about the president's love life. And I think that's a bit of a good indicator in terms of levels of corruption, at least at the very top level. And that's not to say that everyone in the Aquino government is squeaky clean. But the fact is that over the five and a half years, we haven't really seen anything in terms of scandals that break out at the top level. And as was pointed out by um, Chairman um, of COA, uh, the 
PDAF is, is something that came out from 2007 to 2009, so it's an old issue. Um, that being said, there are still problems, as uh, the ombudsman has pointed out, within the bureaucracy in terms of cleaning up the bureaucracy, uh, making sure that people who are serving in our civil service are indeed qualified, um, and that the means and mechanisms by which we can fire people within the bureaucracy are there. Um, I've heard a lot of complaints from our government partners that they have very, a very difficult time reassigning or firing people who are underperforming or who are in fact uh, suspected of being corrupt. And so these are some of the things I think that we have to, to put in place to unclutter uh, the bureaucracy. Um, and I think the other thing we have to recognize, which, which I recognize, is the fact that the Aquino government, or at least President Aquino, has appointed some very good people in key positions. Um, among them are a couple who are sitting on the stage with us this afternoon. Um, I trust Ombudsman Carpio Morales. I trust that she's doing her job well. And if somebody says that she's coddling Aquino uh, uh, people, officials, I would not believe that because I trust her more than I trust the rumors. And that's important. The kind of trust that uh, the current administration has engendered is very important. If you look at the SWS survey on uh, the net satisfaction, I think it's in uh, the book, um, net satisfaction of presidents, President Aquino enjoys probably the highest net satisfaction rating of, of any president throughout a, a whole term. And I think that speaks about the belief and integrity that, that he engenders. Um, I think, so that's very important. The trust, uh, there's a lot of cynicism, and, and Ramon and I were in a meeting about three weeks ago, and we talked about the levels of cynicism that's out there, and even Maria and I were talking about that before we came on stage. Um, I don't think the level of cynicism now is any higher than it was six, seven, eight years ago. What's different is it's all visible now because of social media. We can now see what people are thinking through their Twitter accounts, their Facebook accounts, Instagram, etc. We didn't see that 10 years ago. So we, it was harder to see the levels of cynicism. So I don't think we're any more cynical today than we were 10 years ago. Um, let me, let's take questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, we've got roughly five minutes left before the end of the panel. Anyone wanna, want a mic? Please. <laughs> I'd like to provoke a little bit of a discussion. Um, Earlier or throughout the day, we've been talking about the need for more efficiency and more effectiveness in the implementation of projects. And when you look at the implementation of projects, you look at what are the bottlenecks. And whether it's um, valid or not, uh, sometimes the role of COA comes up, particularly in relation to the way government bureaucrats behave. Yes. Some people describe it as being overly careful in the way they do their project because they are afraid they will be coa or they will be subjected to intense COA scrutiny. I guess the question that I'd like to pose and maybe invite a comment from the chairman is, is this. Um, in the private sector, the attitude we take towards auditors is auditors are there to help management implement their projects effectively without, uh, well, while minimizing, I guess, the possibility of corruption. What you do is you look at the risk factors, you, inst you institute mechanisms and devices to eliminate the possibility of corruption within the projects that you're undertaking. And then you make sure that people adhere to those policies and programs. Second, there is the issue of materiality. Uh, when, does, uh, when is intense scrutiny appropriate uh, in relation to how much of an impact the project has or the transaction that's being undertaken? And third is the overall attitude. Uh, I am involved in one small government agency, which is the National Museum, and even there we sometimes feel it, that sometimes the auditors convey the attitude that everybody is a crook is a unless you can prove yourself to be innocent. So I guess these are some of the things that are somewhat bothersome. Hey, I'm not arguing about the need to fight corruption because yes. I am a great admirer of that. But I think there is a need for a balance. And what I'm suggesting is perhaps at the start of the new administration, it would be useful for all the parties to come together and say, this is the role of audit. And this is the role of management, meaning the executive departments. And let's see what we can do to work together so that the audit function does not determine the pace of projects uh, necessarily, so that there is more effectiveness in the way projects are implemented uh, while still protecting sufficiently 
I guess, the quality of the projects that are being undertaken. I don't know if I'm being sufficiently <laughs> articulate about what I'm trying to say, I but this is something that's been, <laughs> that's been nagging me in, my, in the back of my head, so I just wanted to bring it out here. Thank you. Chairman Aguinaldo. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, it's a point well taken to a certain extent. Um, it's really a problem of mindsets. Um, uh, well, there was the comment that um, it's like there's a presumption that everyone is a crook. If you look at our procurement law, it presumes everyone in government is a crook. That's why you have such archaic rules. And uh, that's one of the hindrances that we also see uh, for our auditors because they're stuck with those rules. Um, and for example, in, in your case, sir, you, I think, have served as an ambassador uh, in the past. And, you know, you can see the difficulties because they're trying to apply Philippine rules to procurement being done in a foreign country. And some of them just don't work. And so those are some of the problems that we have. And, and really, it, it's a mindset thing. Because I think uh, for the longest time, that's what they've been drilled to do, to be a watchdog for resources. Although what uh, we tell them is when you're a watchdog for resources, that means actually two things. You know? One is you, of course, go after those who misuse resources or abuse resources. But it also means that you teach those who are using the resources to use them properly in the fulfillment of their mandates. And I think that is one of the thrusts that we have moving forward, um, that the Commission on Audit isn't just a watchdog. Um, if you go back 30 years ago, Commission on Audit was also a guardian angel. And what that really meant was they're supposed to enable or empower agencies uh, to better use their resources. So that's part of the mindset that we're trying to cultivate. Um, we just ask for patience because it takes time to cultivate mindsets. And really, you, there are some that you have to uh, reorient. The other problem, I think, related to that is there are just so many rules, and some of them are conflicting, and some of them are uh, probably need to be revised, not only within the COA, but within the uh, government as well as a whole. Uh, again, this is one of the things we're trying to look at. If we can codify our rules, make it simpler to understand, then that would be better. I think this is something that hasn't really been a focus over the past years, no? but that's something that we are trying to work on looking forward. At the same time, a question has been asked uh, when we were developing our strategic plan. You know, um, why does COA have to change? Why don't the agencies change? <laughs> And uh, it wasn't difficult to respond. I said, well, someone has to show the way. So let it be us. Let's show them that we're the ones who can change our mindset. And at the same time, maybe they will see also what we're trying to do and better appreciate it. I'm proud to say I've gone around the country, visited their different offices, and I've had feedback from some uh, public officials who fortunately have auditors who are willing to engage with them. And so they have pretty decent relationships. You say, some of them will say, our auditor is strict, but at least we are able to discuss and they're able to you know, provide solutions. And that's what I'm stressing uh, among our people, that one of our roles is actually to find solutions, not just to be a stumbling block. No, finding solutions is perfect. Just you want? I just uh, chime in, yeah. and it's going to be very quick. I'm very glad that uh, the chairman of COA is talking about transformation of mindset. And that is exactly what we need in good governance. What we've seen, for example, in several of the cities that we're working with, it's an amazing change of attitude down to the last janitor. And that is what we need to do. And I would argue it's not yet there. I'm very <laughs> glad that uh, the Goa chairman is talking about angels and they want to be angels. And that's precisely what we're talking about. It will take some time. But we cannot give up, we'll have to keep going. And in fact, every year we'll have to make a significant change in progress. Over the last three decades, I hear you say that with such optimism every time. Can I, we have just one last statement from each of you, and this one, let's throw it to the future. And you've each, uh, three of you have alluded to the upcoming elections and what we should be looking for, and you've talked about scale. So one thing that needs to scale in the next round, and how do you choose the next leader? Scale, first. May I address that? Because uh, the Ombudsman was talking about the DILG. It is a way of scaling up. We're dealing with something like 30 different cities, but there are 140 of them. And I do not know how many municipalities we have, 
1,500. If you're talking about scale, the only thing you need to do is to work very closely with the ILG. They have an academy that trains all of these local officials. And what you need to do is to share experiences that are already there, that have been tested, tested under Philippine conditions. Now, the same thing would be true at the national government level. For example, the Civil Service Commission has the Strategic Personnel Management uh, System, SPMS. It's a fantastic thing. It's oriented towards strategy. It's oriented towards actually delivering performance, not stopping people from doing things. And I guess with COA and CSC working together, you can affect the international government. You can scale up. And the opportunity for doing that is starting July of 2016, provided, as the Ombudsman was saying, we elect the right people with the right values and integrity. And who are those? <laughs> Well, in terms of scale, just to give you a, a, an idea, in 2014, the Commission on Audit audited about 18,500 agencies. We have 4,000 CPAs, and they audited 18,500 agencies. They reviewed 300,000 contracts. They inspected 2 million deliveries and physical projects. And so you can see it is quite a big scale. Um, we do have space to hire more people, but at the rate government has grown and, and the country has grown, it has really become a big challenge for us. That's why one of our initiatives really involves the citizens' participatory audit. Uh, there was a message earlier from the Honorable Ombudsman talking about shared responsibility, shared vision, and that's what we hope to bring to the citizens through some of our projects. I've discussed some of this before to some of the people in the audience, the use of geotagging technology to help monitor uh, projects. I think Rappler is very heavily invested in that technology as well. But we're basically asking citizens, hey, help us monitor, help us make sure that people are doing their jobs, help us make sure that your roads are being built and that they're being built properly. And so that's, I think, moving forward, that is something of a necessity. And we're not alone. The DSWD has that issue as well. And if you look at Yolanda Reconstruction, they've had to seek help from outside because some things are just too big for uh, the government to handle on its own. Ramon, your scale and leader. The scale I'm looking for, uh, well, I, I am focused on the private, private sector. And I think there is much to do there. As I said earlier, we are looking to scale up the um, efforts of the Integrity Initiative. And I look at everyone here as people whom I hope will join us in this crusade to build this culture of integrity within our own sector. Uh, and the way we will do that is a step-by-step -step process. First sign up with a pledge and then undertake the appraisal systems that are in place and eventually go through a certification process. And our hope is that it will serve us because it will eventually level the playing field where we don't have to compete on the basis of he can, who can offer the, the highest bribe but we can offer the best services and the best products and the best pricing, etc. Uh, and maybe it is a sort of utopian dream, but we think that that's the only way to go. We, as I said earlier, we really cannot expect government to do everything on their own. We really need to do our part, and we really need to do it seriously. And even if there are handicaps and difficulties along the way, we must stay the course. The next leader we're looking for is one with integrity, of course, but also one who can bring various parties of our society together. I think one of the challenges of our society is for us to all come together and work together towards a common vision, towards a common dream of a more progressive country where all of us will ultimately enjoy better lives. Thank you very much. Vince. Um, I won't talk about scale and leadership. I'll talk about sustainability and leadership. Um, the term of uh, Ombudsman Carpio Morales ends in 2018. The next president will appoint her successor. The next president will also appoint 10 or 11 justices to the Supreme Court. Correct. We're all worried about that. And I think if we look at the process by which these people get appointed, in these, in these particular cases, it's the Judicial and Bar Council that has responsibility for this. If the Judicial and Bar Council hands the next president a list of three Carpio Morales type candidates, for the Ombudsman, the, the president is hand-tied. 
to choose a Carpio Morales type ombudsman, right? So it's not really the president, it's the Judicial and Bar Council. And I think the pressure point has to be put on these kinds of agencies. They're the ones responsible for the kinds of leadership we have at the Supreme Court, at the Sandigan Bayan, at the Ombudsman. So I want to make that point. Second, in terms of leadership, I will not tell you who I'm going to vote for, because I don't know yet who I'm voting for. I know, it's but so close, guys. What's, what's important, I think, is that we are not, we should be thinking not in terms of voting for an individual. We should be thinking about voting for political parties. We always forget that. Our focus is on individuals. We should be voting for political parties. And I think this is what we need to do going forward. And I think I spoke about this at the last Arancada that I spoke uh, at five years ago. We need to have real political parties in this country so that we can, can have continuing platforms of governance and not depend solely on messiahs, on saviors, but really on a whole political system that will serve the needs of the people. And I think this is something we often forget when it comes close to elections. So we should really talk about strengthening political parties. I would love to debate, but um, let's bring it to the ombudsman. So just to be transparent, the last piece I wrote on her is hashtag the leader I want, leadership lessons from Conchita Carpio Morales. Let's talk about what you need from us in order to scale what you're doing, and then how do you push society to choose the leader? We have always uh, attempted, and we succeeded, in all involving private uh, organizations, uh, the private sector, because to us, uh, the office of the ombudsman cannot do its mandate alone. We have to engage the help of stakeholders, the private sectors, other organizations, and uh, we're trying also to institute the uh, the reforms that we have adopted. And uh, we are also trying to get Congress to give us more teeth, as if our teeth were not enough. And we are being criticized for asking more teeth. But uh, for example, we're asking Congress to give us the authority to come up with provisional remedies even while we are investigating cases. When I say provisional remedies, that would include uh, trying to uh, attach properties of uh, uh, corruptors, uh, of malefactors, because by the time the investigation is done and the case is filed in court, the respondent is already aware that we are going to seize or forfeit his properties illegally uh, acquired by him. So we're trying to get Congress also to pass a law to enable us to uh, wire tap to a limited extent without violating the Constitution so that we can use that in our fact-finding investigation or, and, or our preliminary investigation. All these legislative measures that we want to be passed, we believe uh, could help us uh, strengthen in the carrying out of our mandate. But uh, people mistake this for being uh, power conscious or power grubbers. But no, we do this because in my more than four years stay in the office of the ombudsman, we need all the things so that we can succeed in driving the point that we should put the corrupt to jail and we should, uh, if those who, uh, who are in jail have uh, illegally acquired properties, we should seize them because these illegally acquired properties belong to the state. Ombudsman, the last question is uh, the justice system. Some of the problems that you run into and, and our problem in justice society. Justice system? Yeah, because sometimes if people get away with it with impunity and much as we can try to inspire change amongst ourselves, if people continue to get away with it, how are we able to change this, the values of our society? Is the justice system moving fast enough? If you mean the justice system... Uh, uh in terms of our courts, in, in terms, terms of, of the actual of our courts, yes, yes. of our courts, I had been there. <laughs> now, um, I have always said that um, the court has control of proceedings. When a case is filed in court, the only role that the ombudsman plays is to prosecute. It's only that to present the evidence that we gathered. By the way. I have always also said that we don't file a case if we believe that the evidence is not strong. Because if we think that the evidence is weak, you might as well dismiss the case. You are just putting too much burden on the prosecutors. Now, 
if after the case is filed and our uh, prosecutors present the evidence and the, the court appreciates the evidence, the burden of, uh, of the evidence shifts to the defense. Now, if the defense tries to controvert or successfully controverts the evidence of the prosecution, then the case faces dismissal. But if the court believes that the defense has not uh, controverted the evidence of the prosecution, then the inevitable decision is for the court to dismiss, uh, to convict the accused. But again, there have been some problems about delay. Again, the ombudsman has no say in the matter of delay because it will only prosecute the case and it will only oppose any dilatory tactics of uh, lawyers who represent uh, the defense. And uh, uh, again, these lawyers sometimes uh, bring every incident to the appellate courts and that causes delay. So you see, there should be some control from the Supreme Court because it supervises and controls the uh, administration of justice. Uh, and I'm not saying that the Supreme Court is not uh, doing its job, but it should put more strength in uh, its uh, discharge of its role as uh, controller and uh, supervisor, quote unquote, controller and supervisor of the administration of justice. To, uh, in other words, the bottom line is that uh, the courts have control of the proceedings and uh, the ombudsman has no longer any role in it except to oppose any dilatory moves because there have been complaints that panay ang file ng file ng ombudsman na yan wala naman nangyayari wala naman na ko convict i'm sorry but the ombudsman does not convict it only files cases against the accused it only presents evidence against the accused and uh, if the evidence does not turn out to be strong as we perceive them then i'm sorry Thank you. Uh, I think we all agree progress has been made, but the future is tenuous depending on who takes over. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panel from the gentlemen and our ombudsman. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, dear panelists. May I request you to please come a bit forward for a souvenir photo.